Welcome to the course Women and Youth Empowerment in Agriculture. This is module five on strategies for empowering women in agriculture and zero in on modernizing agriculture. What can we do to modernize African agriculture so that women and youth will become empowered and be attracted into the sector? The module introduces you, the course participants, to strategies for modernizing agriculture. We weave through topics dealing with institutional change, price policy and incentives, labor and commodity markets, technological change for agricultural intensification, as well as adoption of agricultural entrepreneurship, post-harvest technology, and other packages of green revolution, agrobiotechnology, and digitalization for agricultural growth. At the end of this model, we should be able to align and discuss the strategies for modernizing agriculture to empower women and youth. In the form of an introduction, we have seen, if we, if we can recall in the other models, our highlighting of the fact that agriculture has potentials to contribute significantly to Africa's economic transformation, just as it did earlier in many developed countries. It can increase incomes in rural areas, increase exports and foreign exchange, supply raw materials, release labor for manufacturing, boost supply of food to the growing urban areas, as well as expand markets for agri agricultural based inputs and consumption goods and services for non agricultural sectors. With agriculture making up the bulk of uh, African economies and with most of the poor relying on subsistence farming for their livelihoods, Africa's economic transformation will therefore have to include modernizing agriculture to increase the productivity of smallholders and benefit from the potentials of the sector. In this case, this will require using agriculture as a basis for stimulating manufacturing and services, particularly by increasing agro-processing and other agro-business ventures, which will create jobs, especially for women and youth. It will also increase the demand and perhaps even prices for what smallholders produce and thus enhance their income and welfare. Modern agriculture plays an, an enormous role in improving the living standards and quality of life of humans by increasing the availability of food all year round at affordable prices. When we talk of modern agriculture, we are referring to an approach based on high input and high output procedures, such as practicing intense tillage, use of abundant irrigation water, use of inorganic fertilizers, genetic manipulation of plants, and chemical control of pests and diseases to meet the demand for food and fuel. Modern agriculture is also termed as intensive farming or modern farming or intensive agriculture. It reduces the time and mundane nature of farm work, thus making agriculture attractive to youth, particularly to young girls. Agriculture, again, as we saw previously, has some significant importance. It increases food production, ensures food security, improves affordability, ensures food safety, alleviates the physical pressure on the environment. And over the years, we have had agricultural revolutions through which mankind's well-being and welfare has gradually improved over the centuries. When we talk of an agricultural revolution, we are referring to a dramatic and sudden change in practices that bears significant impacts on the function of society and in turn changes ongoing operations of society as a whole. The first agricultural revolution dates back to to the 18th century in the pre 1900s, as well as the second revolution was post World War I when mechanization gained pace. The third revolution is the Green Revolution in the 1960s and 1970s, as well as the fourth revolution, which is the digital revolution that began since the 1980s and it is here with us today. Like, as we are going to see in the figures, in the figure below, modernization of agriculture can be defined or identified in the four phases that we've just explained. The adoption of modern agriculture here during the 18th century, it was a period of rapid experimentation and innovation in food and production and livestock breeding, leading to the development of various new tools and soil management practices. The second agricultural revolution, just immediately after the First World War, was mechanization in the 1920s. That followed the invention of the internal combustion engine, which led to the manufacturers of tractors and other farm tools in the 1920s. These helped to increase, increase farm efficiencies and reduced the workload in the farms, especially on labor. Revolution number three is a green revolution in the 1960s and 70s. 
after the end of the Second World War in, in 1939, uh, um, in 1945, then in the 1950s and 1960s, we saw an increase in the application of the science of chemistry and biology in the breeding of new plant varieties. This precipitated the Green Revolution in the 60s and 70s, whereby the use of nitrogen and phosphate fertilizers became widespread and global grain output tripled. Finally, we have in front of us and, and amongst and within us, revolution number four, the digital revolution which commenced in the 1980s. This is a digitalization and entering into the fourth agricultural revolution. In many parts of the world, the green revolution has left a legacy of overcultivation, excessive chemical use that contributed to widespread land degradation and pollution. But today farmers are aware of such, of such pollution. So they make conscious effort to balance calculations weighing up the amount of chemicals that they can put into their farms. And with digital technology, they can actually do better computerization and therefore provide for the, for the soil or for, or for the water needs of the farm or even the livestock enterprise an adequate and efficient, effective quantity of, of resource input. Our figure identifies the four types of revolution in agricultural sector that mankind has gone through. Number one, adoption of modern agriculture. Number two, mechanization and post, after, post, uh, after World War I. Number three, the green revolution. And number four, the digital revolution, which is here with us. And that has gone through a series, a series of steps, a series of stages with, comp with increasing change, change and improvement or innovation of the digital technology. And today we have the smart mo mobile telephones on our palms which can be linked through sensors to various portions of our farm. And the farmer or the farm manager can get real-time information to monitor his or her farm. Therefore, it is truly a revolution. But for revolutions to have a significant effect on the agricultural sector, institutions manned by men and women can be used effectively to ensure that agriculture delivers. Institutions are the forefront of change and any change in agriculture will begin with changes in the operationalization in institutions. Smallholder farmers often lack opportunities to negotiate better terms of trade for the agricultural products and to hold governmental and non-governmental organizations accountable for their role in rural development. Their powerlessness is closely linked to a lack of services as well as the limited provision and quality of public goods. Institution, that we talk about, what, what is it? Institution in its most general sense refers to different types of organizations, markets, contracts, cultural norms, and informal or formal rules that define rights of access to goods and services, as well as access to the management of a given space or to its natural resources. Examples of institutions will include governmental departments, such as the ministries, all kinds of ministries, ministries of agriculture, ministries of fisheries, ministries of crops and livestock, regional development, as well as other institutions attached to governmental bodies like the National Agricultural Research Institute, public universities, faculties of agriculture, schools of agriculture, national commodity boards, and regional and developmental programs. You also have private institutions, market institutions, financial institutions, and local institutions that will include the regional councils, the municipal councils that are meant to be institutional structures through which plans and decisions re regarding the agricultural sector can be hatched and discussed and coordinated. There are also, in addition, several quasi-governmental entities as well as non-governmental and other organizations which operate at the community level. For example, you have cooperatives, producer cooperatives, women's groups, Within the agricultural sector, there are diverse kinds of cooperatives. You have producer cooperatives and consumer cooperatives, as well as marketing cooperatives. Effective rural institutions and organizations will therefore help farmers to overcome certain barriers by increasing their productivity and profitability, by reducing the price of inputs which farmers pay for, by organizing groups and communities in a more like, which are more likely to have their voices heard as a group than if they went individually. When farmer organizations and cooperatives join forces at higher levels, they can influence policy dialogue and decisions that affect 
their ability to succeed. Strong rural institutions therefore also promote social cohesion and stability, decreasing the adverse consequences of political and economic disenfranchisement. Institutions again can also serve as drivers of rural change. In serving as drivers of rural change, functioning inclusive institutions are key to rural transformation and to ensuring that poverty reduction efforts are sustainable. Organizations such as market associations or cooperative associations, which are dominated by women and help rural women and men negotiate better prices for their produce and, and access, access to markets. These organizations also facilitate dialogue among smallholder farmers, governments, donors, and the private sector. When rural voices are heard under such an umbrella organization, it is more likely that proper policies will be comprehensive, complementary, well-placed to meet the diverse needs and realities of small producers in rural communities. Organizations, again, such as the microfinance institutions and credit unions, also make it easier for marginalized groups, such as indigenous peoples or women and youth who are marginalized to access loans and credit for their farm and off farm activities, including for longer term investments even, okay? Community driven development approaches typically rely on local communities to prioritize investment needs for rural development. So institutions are very, very important and significant for agricultural growth. An alternative way of looking at the role of institutions in agricultural development is typical in terms of the three widely recognized pillars of agricultural development and poverty reduction policies. A, expanding access to assets. Access like what? Such as land and capital. B, development of markets. C, investment in basic goods, such as rural roads and research. These respectively involve the development of institutions concerning property rights, because when we talk of access to assets, development of markets, as well as public goods, we are talking about property rights issues. We are talking about markets and the management of public good investments. For example, through state-owned organizations or private contractors. There are also downstream and upstream institutional issues regarding respectively the what? Utilization of investment or policy outputs. For example, newly acquired or redistributed assets or market services, or new knowledge, or even technology, okay? And the allocation of financial and other resources to these and other alternative activities and investments. So institutions play an important role in the allocation, distribution, and effective dissemination and democratization of the access of power. Institu institutions do not live in a vacuum. Institutions that the agricultural sector needs for its proper functioning will help the agricultural sector to move into the markets. Bumper harvest will require markets so that producers and consumers are linked and for production to be complete, the, the good has to get to the final consumer. Therefore, rural markets, pride pol policy and incentives are very, very important. Pharmacists access to markets and ability to command fair prices for their commodities is paramount for the profitability of their efforts. Different policies and markets affect the prices farmers receive for their products and prices consumers even pay. Most countries in the world, for example, including even the rich developed countries, adopt policies that have an impact on the agricultural sectors. Through such policies, governments seek to influence the behavior of farmers, behavior of traders, behavior of processors and others involved in the agricultural value chains. For example, Trade and domestic market policies are intended to affect prices farmers receive for their produce in addition to input prices. Governments also may use budgetary transfers to support specific groups, either directly or indirectly, through investments in public goods, such as what? Public research and public infrastructure. As we can see in the figure below, the, there is a strong link between farmers as agricultural producers on the far left upstream and the final consumer that occupies an important place downstream by different opportunities of, and this generates different opportunities of commodity exchange. The key players in this chain are who? The wholesalers and retailers. Who? Wholesalers and retailers. Wholesalers, yes. Traditional wholesalers and traditional retailers who undertake diverse services 
storage, packaging, and transportation in undertaking their services and their responsibilities, they incur costs and transform the commodities to enhance the value and benefits of the commodity. Government institutions and policies, on the other hand, have to regulate the behaviors of these marketing agents so that farmers are not exploited and consumers are not cheated or consumers are not ripped off. Therefore, we have two strands or three, three, three possibilities that the chain can move from the farmer to the consumer. The chain can move from the farmer through specialized dedicated wholesalers and the modern retail supermarkets directly to the consumers. In other words, these specialized modern agents can buy directly from farms. There is also the, the possibility of passing through the traditional wholesaler, uh, into the traditional wholesale market to the traditional retailer and to the consumers. Third, there is the direct link from the farmer through the traditional retailer to the consumers. So there are more, a plethora of channels through which markets can be created to link the farmers to the consumers. Agriculture for development. And the World Bank in its 2008 World Development Report asserted that improving the productivity, profitability, and sustainability of smallholder farming is a main pathway out of poverty. This According to the World Bank, we require a broad array of policy instruments, many of which apply differently to commercial smallholders and to those in subsistence farming. It can be used to achieve the following. It can be used to achieve, to improve price incentives and increase the quality and quantity of public investment. It can be used to make product markets work better. It can be used to improve access to financial services and reduce exposure to uninsured risks. It can be used the performance of producer organizations. It can be used to promote innovation through science and technology, and it can be used to make agriculture more sustainable and a provider of environmental services. To make the product and input markets work better will require important policy initiatives. Remember, the market brings the producers and the consumers together. Is a link, is a channel through which other agents whether wholesalers or retailers can link the producers to the consumers. With major structural changes in agricultural markets and the entry of powerful new actors, such as supermarket supply chains, a key issue is now emerging, you know, a key issue is now emerging in the development literature about the exploitation of smallholders by the supermarket chains, uh, with this having an impact on whether agriculture can actually play an important role in reducing poverty of the small, particularly of the small farmers. Food staple markets will require careful consideration also, okay? Because the, the, the market chain and the market channel involves costs. Reducing transaction costs and risks in food staple markets can promote faster growth and benefit the poor. Beyond investments in infrastructure, promising innovations will include commodity exchanges. So most African countries will have to move to commodity exchanges. Some countries have commodity exchanges on cash export crops like tobacco, cocoa, and coffee. We may need commodity exchanges for other staple food crops, as well as market information systems based on rural radio and short messaging services, the SMS, or warehouse receipt systems and market-based risk management tools. A particularly thorny issue in food market and the agricultural chain is how to manage price volatility, okay? Price volatility, price incessant fluctuation. For politically sensitive food stables in countries where they account for a large share of consumer spending, what comes to mind is commodities like rice, sugar, milk, bread. If the food staple is tradable, insurance through exchange traded futures contracts can sometimes manage price risks. Again, risk management that emerges or pops up from the market channel can also be enhanced by more open borders and private trade. High risks of price volatility remain for both farmers and consumers in many agriculture-based countries, and effective safety nets will continue to be important until incomes rise or market performance improves. To, have an, to modernize agriculture, 
take advantage of the agricultural revolutions, make sure that the markets work better. We also have to pay attention also on the input markets. This time, the input markets. In the case of, more interestingly, labor input. Labor is an interesting input in the development of agriculture in most African countries. Not only because a majority of the people in the continent are employed in the agricultural sector, but there is a lot of overemployment, underemployment within the agricultural sector. Therefore, we must get it right, the management of the labor market, whether for rural farm activities or non-farm activities. We've always seen that agriculture employs significant proportion of people in the rural areas and along the value chain, as well as into peri-urban and even urban areas. The performance of the labor market to hire and compensate farm and non-farm labor is therefore important for both farm-related and non-farm labor. The functioning of rural labor markets is critical, therefore, to the success of pol policies intended to promote poor, pro poor growth. And again, according to the World Bank in its 2008 World Development Report, labor is one asset the poor possesses very, and, and, and relies on it very, very strongly for their welfare. They have only their labor to work for themselves, only their labor to sell for an income. Thus, for growth to be inclusive, the rural poor must be able to participate in growth through more remunerative uses of their labor, which for the poor who truly have no other assets means selling their labor through the market. Rural economies in general are mixed with rural farming and non-farming population and in their living from both agricultural and non-agricultural activities. So when you go to typical rural African settings, we have farm and non-farm activities. We have farm and non-farm population. So it's a mix and diverse opportunities of trade of the poorest asset, which is labor. The agricultural and non-agricultural labor markets are interdependent, competing with each other for, for available labor resources, especially during peak season. So whether it is the agricultural labor market or the non-agricultural labor market, rural people have to sell their services. They have to sell their labor. Again, remember that we said labor is the only asset that they have. The exchange of labor in rural areas takes a variety of forms. For example, wage labor, agency contracts, provision of personalized services, self-employment or trade, and a broad variety of spot markets, open air flea markets for agricultural commodities, especially in the rural areas, the peri-urban areas, and in, even in the urban settings of most Africans, African, African countries, spot markets are predominant. They operate competitively in addition to some informal mechanisms. Some of the characteristics of rural labor markets include family labor is predominant, People work on their own farms. However, they can sell their labor during peak season to other farms. Then there are diverse contractual arrangements, such as in sharecropping, okay, the two party systems or the multiple party systems where someone can use his labor to work in another, in the proprietor's farm, in, farm enterprise and he or she is paid in kind. There is also the coexistence of the spot labor markets, okay, coexistence of spot labor markets where you can hire day workers on day-to-day -day basis or ca casual labor with these having long run implicit and exp explicit contracts and as well as interlocking market effects. These contractual arrangements have important implications for women and youth. In the rural setting, you may have static and dynamic profile of the rural non-farm economy. The non-farm activities form an important and integral part of the rural economies of developing countries amid wide variation and composition of rural non-farm employment, typically, which typically includes one third, 30% manufacturing and another 30% commerce with services, mining and construction making up the, the other portion. Most non-farm enterprises are quite small, self-employed with one person firms predominating, okay? Unlike the case of formal wage labor force where women constitute almost 40%, or more of those engaged. 
Frequently, they account for the majority of the rural non-farm entrepreneurs. Because of extremely low capital requirements and seasonal demand, most businesses operate with excess capacity or oversupply of family level. In a dynamic setting of rural non-farm economy, we are referring to a situation where the locality is prosperous and there are many enterprises, unlike in, the rural, in, a, in a typical rural area where there's lack of dynamism. That one, we say it is static. Now we have to look at dynamic profile of the rural non-farm economy. These are in regions which are prosperous economically. Here there's dynam dynamism in the labor market. Labor, labor market is, is very, very dynamic. It's not static. People can sell their labor. There is demand for their labor. And they play the games of how to supply their labor to the highest bidder, whether it's on, a, it's on casual labor, spot market for labor. Such efforts are characterized with rising wages and buoyant demand which stimulate growth in increasingly productive non-farm activity and non-farm employment growth signals prosperity. When we have non-farm employment, hiring people, non-farm, hiring of labor, that signals prosperity. But the, in contrast to stagnant rural regions, a surge in non-farm employment may perhaps reflect a not so good news that the pop, that pop, that population growth is it's it's the one forcing non-farm activities to act as a sponge soaking up soaking up excess workers in marginal and low-paying jobs. On the on the other hand, again in prosperous regions, employment growth concentrates increasingly in rural towns and in full-time enterprises with higher employees. The composition of activity also changes in in in, in regions with prosperous economies. The composition of activity also changes with a decline in very labor intensive, often household based activities, and an increase in higher investments and higher productivity enterprises. Transport, food preparation, repair, and other services normally grow, while household manufacturing industries tend to decline in the dynamic areas. Women typically bear the, the, the brunt and also, as well as the benefits of labor market and economic adjustments in a dynamic setting. Where there are benefits, women reap the benefits, and where there are challenges, they bear the brunt. They predominate the non-farm sector in, with respect to weaving in African rural settings, basket making, and many other household-based activities that generally decline if there is a dynamic economy where they can sell their labor to growing enterprises and growing non-farm sectors. While many growing non-farm activities milling, processing, storage, food preparation, normally employ women. The necessary capital investment in mechanical milling, transport, some food processing and manufacturing forms, forms an intimidating barrier which prevents women from participation in this transformation and growth. So they may be left behind despite this seemingly buoyant, dynamic economic setting. Although rural transformation offers improved opportunities for non-farm laborers and for the rural poor in general, women's access to larger, full-time, higher investment and higher productivity in non-farm businesses is not assured. Access to investment funds and education combined with child rearing and other household challenges tend to constrain women as they try to respond to new opportunities that emerge in a dynamic, buoyant, buoyant economy. That, that is a challenge we face, but while that kind of effort or challenge may exist, it also has opportunities that we'll talk about better household management and better peasant household control and supervision, better household economics, what labor to supply, how much to supply, for whom to supply. In, an, in, a, in a dynamic rural setting where rural development is enhanced and the rural non-farm sector is, is growing, the poor whose only asset is labor has have a chance to make a decision on where to sell their labor, get better remuneration, which can be used for market purchases and improve their welfare. 
but despite the difficulties that they go through, technology and technological change are also important. Technology and technological change are part of the packages within agricultural revolution over the centuries. It is about reducing or easing the mundane and drudgery of farm work. As Africa's population grows, the challenge is to find ways and means to produce enough food for food security, industrial raw materials, as well as agriculture, as well as international trade and exports. The increasing role of technology in addressing these issues is the only way forward to a food secure, developed agriculture, as well as a modern agricultural sector. Farmers need technology. Technology is important to make their operations as efficient, productive, and profitable as possible. With technology, it can help save foreign exchange for countries, increase productivity, and lead to an improvement in the overall standard of farmers, standard of living in farmers' communities. However, in sub-Saharan Africa in particular, and Africa in general, there is a long way to go in adoption of modern farming practices through technology. The pace is slow. The path-breaking efforts, a lot of path-breaking efforts need to be made to educate farmers about the benefits to be gained from adopting, taking up, and using technology, transcending the barriers of archaic farming practices and medieval mindsets is the challenge that needs to be overcome for a modern Africa. Technology has a major role in farming and agricultural practices. And with the advent of digital technology in particular, the scope has been widened. Innovation in agriculture is already lead, leading an evolution in agricultural practices, which reduces which reduce losses and increase efficiency. For example, Technology in agriculture affects many areas of agriculture, such as fertilizers, pesticides, and seed technology. Biotechnology and genetic engineering also have resulted in pest resistance and increased crop yields. Mechanization has also led to efficient tilling, harvesting, and a reduction in manual labor. Irrigation methods and transportation systems have improved, pro improved. Processing machinery has reduced wastage, and the effect is visible in some parts of the African continent. And which confirms very clearly that technology not only plays a major role, but technological innovations are very, very important to reduce losses and increase efficiency. There is therefore enormous pressure on the agricultural food system, given the, the, the steady and increasing rise in population and the risk that African countries may be trapped in the Matusan trap by the year 2050, when there will be a population a population bulge. Continued population growth, rapidly changing consumption patterns, and the impacts of the emerging climate change and environmental degradation are driving limited resources of food, energy, water, and materials towards critical threshold values. These pressures are substantial across the continent, where countries have, have to find innovative ways to boost crop and livestock production to to avoid becoming more reliant on imports and food aid. Sustainable agricultural intensification, therefore, in other words, producing more output from the same area of land while reducing the negative environmental impacts represents a possible solution for Africa's agricultural sector. So while Africa is, shall be adopting, while there is increasing push to adopt technology in the African continent, we should also have to cater for agricultural intensification more output from less input use. Agricultural intensification in general is defined as an increase in agricultural production per unit of input, which may be labor, these inputs may be land, maybe time, maybe fertilizer, seeds or fish, feed, okay, or, or, or even cash. For practical purposes, intensification occurs when there is an increase in the total volume of agricultural production, which results from a higher productivity of inputs or agricultural production is maintained while certain inputs are decreased. Intensification, which takes the form of increased production, is most critical when there is need to expand the food supply, for example, during periods of rapid population growth. Intensification also makes efficient use of inputs and may be more critical with environmental problems or social, social values. Promoting technology, exploiting the market for labor, taking advantage of the agricultural value chain and being key players 
in the agricultural revolutions, agricultural and entrepreneurship is also important. Agriculture in general provides attractive options for investments to, to achieve better returns to capital and create wealth for individuals and, and rural households and even urban households. The short-term, medium-term or long-term potentials of agriculture as an investment niche or opportunity has been echoed so many times and very often by the African Development Bank. So why is agriculture attractive for investment? Even though agriculture faces many challenges, including globalization and market liberalization, as well as food price crisis, or natural resource depletion, or climate change, rapid urbanization, changing production and consumption patterns, demographic changes, etc. Despite all these challenges, however, many of these directly or indirectly lead to changing markets and create both opportunities and risks for farmers, especially for smallholders, youth, and women. With a growing recognition of the important role of smallholder agriculture for economic growth and rural development in many countries, market-oriented agriculture appears more predominantly on the agenda of many multilateral agencies. So many organizations, both within countries and internationally, are, to, are targeting the agricultural sector. And with all its problems and all its challenges and difficulties, where all the problems are, that's where the gains are. Agripreneurship is, is therefore key and is becoming top of the agenda. Agripreneurship refers to entrepreneurship in agriculture. Entrepreneurship is a concept that encompasses transforming an, an idea or vision into a new business or a new venture creation or the expansion of an existing business by an individual, a team of individuals or an established business. Entrepreneurship as opposed to self-employment is also defined as the spirit of the entrepreneurs, the vitality and ingenuity of subsistence entrepreneurship that we see in, in African rural areas and peri-urban settings among women and youth in particular. However, more policy efforts need to enhance these survivalism or subsistence entrepreneurship. We need more policy efforts to improve on the business environment, to increase the profitability and revenue returns by women and young entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs in general are typically creative. They take opportunities, accept risks, and can quickly change business strategies to adapt to changing environments. They, they, are, they are innovators. Therefore, the policy ahead for Africa's agriculture also includes promoting entrepreneurship. While usually being innovative and creative, farmers often lack experiences. Um, they have difficulties access, accessing services, people or markets, and skills to having realistic chances to succeed as entrepreneurs. So there is need for training and promotion. In addition, ag agripreneurs are influenced by external systemic factors, such as economic and social barriers, policies and regulations. While these constraints affect all farmers and especially all smallholders, women and youth are particularly affected because of the inherent constraints we've seen and challenges that we've seen in other models, which women and youth are bedeviled with. Despite these challenges, again, agriculture offers opportunities to create wealth. Where there is pain, there is gain. Agriculture offers opportunities to create wealth along the value chain, through production, value addition, export of processed or unprocessed goods, in the value chain, there are many areas in agriculture that entrepreneurs can exploit in on-farm and off-farm activities. The on-farm activities include production, processing, feed and seed processing, farming, put manufacturing, and agro-service ventures. Off-farm ventures will include agritourism, entrepreneurship, and other service areas like transportation, storage and packaging, um, workshops and service centers for the maintenance of agricultural implement, you know, in, in, in the agricultural value chain, among others. You have post harvest technology like processing, packaging, and storage may stabilize food production and ensure against excessive dependence on food imports, even as it creates more openings for, for, for employment. So, the opportunities along the agricultural value chain, in which men and women, boys and girls, women and youth in particular, can begin to exploit, are huge. In the figure below, diverse opportunities are demonstrated to exist for entrepreneurs within the agricultural system. When upstream near the farms or midstream for processing and manufacturing or downstream near, near consumers. Along this value chain, women and youth have the possibility, women and youth have the possibility to uncall the entrepreneurial desires 
to be service providers and value creators. Value creators, the growing population with rising incomes is a ready market to demand and consume diverse services from the agriculture food system. So the entrepreneurship opportunities exist in upstream, midstream, downstream. Upstream, you have input supplies and agricultural production. Midstream, you have handling, storage, and transportation, as well as processing and manufacturing. And downstream, closer to the consumer, you have the wholesalers and, and retailers, as well as import, import exporters. Adopting agricultural entrepreneurship should be top on the agenda in policymaking in any continent. Investing in women and youth is thus critical, given their role in agricultural value chains, as well as women's role in food and nutrition security. It is important to strengthen the entrepreneurial and technical skills of women and youth and to provide them with training and capacity building and while harnessing their innovative potential. Education is key to facilitating women and youth's access to information and better technologies, which are critical to moving beyond production and running successful rural businesses. Investing in education for women and youth while strengthening the entrepreneurial capacities is insufficient without creating an enabling environment positioning them with better access to productive access and assets and markets. Finally, it is important to develop gender sensitive agricultural and nutrition policies in order to boost attention to rural women as key actors of food and nutrition security while overcoming the challenge of feeding and increasing population. The role of ag agripreneurship in the national economy is diverse. Agripreneurship will play, will play roles in, in the growth and development of the national economy through entrepreneurship development, which increases income level and employment opportunities in rural and urban areas. Agripreneurship also, also plays important roles in, in inducing productivity gains by smallholder farmers, integrating them into local, national, and international markets, helps to reduce food costs, supply uncertainties, and improving diets of the rural and urban poor in, in the country. And, and agripreneurship also generates growth, increasing and diversifying income and providing entrepreneurial opportunities in both rural and urban areas. And this happens in the midst of a continuously evolving and innovating agricultural sector. At the, at the introduction of this model, Model 5, we made mention of the revolutions that have ex the agricultural sector has experienced since the 18th century. The Green Revolution family is important to harness all the efforts of policy making and institutional management. When we talk of the Green Revolution, we are talking about the set of research technology transfer initiatives that occur between um, 1950s and 60s that increased agricultural production in, in, in some parts of the world, particularly in Asia and South America. The initiatives resulted in adoption of new technologies, including high yielding varieties of maize and rice and, and, and other cereals, especially wheat. It, it, it was also associated with, with chemical fertilizer use, increased agrochemicals and control water supply, usually involving irrigation and newer methods of cultivation, including mechanization. Green revolution, which most African countries missed, had earlier dramatic successes in Mexico and the Indian subcontinent. Here, the new varieties required large amounts of chemical fertilizers and pesticides to produce their high yields, raising concerns about cost and potentially harmful environmental effects. Unfortunately, poor farmers in some of those countries were unable to afford the fertilizers and pesticides and have often reaped even lower yields with these grains than with the older strains, which were better adapted to local conditions and had some resistance to pests and diseases. So this is very, very instructive that the high yielding varieties that came from the research centers out of the new te technologies in the, green, in the green revolution package had a positive and negative effect. Green revolution technologies moved together with additional inputs of farm chemicals and where farmers who had the modern seeds of high yielding varieties, but without the additional chemicals, they experienced challenges and even losses. The key elements of the agricultural revolution in the 1960s and 70s included use of latest technology and capital inputs, adoption of modern scientific methods of farming, use of high yielding varieties of seeds, proper use of chemical fertilizers, consolidation of land holdings, as well as use of various mechanical devices. This, the basic approach 
was the development of hydrogen varieties of cereals, okay? The expansion of irrigation infrastructure, modernization of management techniques, distribution of hybrid seeds and synthetic fertilizers and pesticides, as the development of new cereal varieties through selective breeding reached their limits, some agricultural scientists tend to the creation of new strains that do not exist in nature. There we had the genetically modified organisms, a phenomenon sometimes referred to as the gene revolution. So we had the green revolution and the gene revolution. The gene revolution rolled out the GMOs, genetically modified organisms. Green revolution also drove intensification which saved new lands from conversion to agriculture, a known source of greenhouse gas emissions and driver to climate change and allowed for the release of marginal lands out for of agricultural production into providing alternative ecosystem services, such as the regeneration of, of, of forest cover. Green revolution technologies are without doubt possible panaceas to the resource constraints faced by women and youth in Africa. Any technology that will give better returns from the use of less land, lower costs of production and labor saving is important in alleviating the resource constraints faced by women and youth. High yielding varieties that came out from the Green Revolution package are more, more responsive to external inputs that were more responsive to external inputs were central to, to the productivity achievements that were seen in India and, and, and Mexico and other parts of Asia and, and, and South America. However, in many cases, appropriate research and policies to incentivize judicial use of inputs were also lacking. Therefore, we had unintended consequences with overutilization of water, soil degradation and chemical runoff, which had serious environmental consequences. The slowdown in yield growth that has been observed since the mid 80s can be attributed in part to the above cited degradation of agricultural resource base. These environmental costs are widely recognized as a potential threat to the long-term sustainability and replication of the green revolution successes. In other words, green revolution successes, while it could improve output, also come with unintended consequences on the environment, which if not properly managed, can have deleterious effects on individuals and households. And the environmental consequences were not caused, again, only by green revolution technology per se, but rather, the policy environment which promoted overuse of inputs and expansion of cultivation to areas that could not sustain high levels of intensification, such as sloping lands. Again, output price protection and input subsidies by some governments. So you had maladjustments and poor responses from governments that oversubsidized some of these green revolution promoting inputs like fertilizer and their subsidization led to overutilization, such that in, in countries like in, in Indonesia in the early 1990s, the removal of pesticide subsidies led to a dramatic drop in insecticide use and improved on environmental management. On the backs of green revolution is agricultural technology. Bio, it's agricultural biotechnology. Biotechnology is an important catalyst that can be worked upon for the modernization of Africa's agriculture. Agricultural biotechnology emerged from the research efforts at the beginning of the Green Revolution. Biotechnology, according to the Convention of Biodiversity, is defined as any technology that is applied to living organisms to make them more valuable to, to people. Farmers have manipulated plants over the years and animals through selective breeding for decades of, or thousands of years. And in the 20th century, there was a surge in technology that resulted in an increase in agricultural biotechnology through the selection of traits or genes, you know, for, for increased yield, for pest resistance, drought resistance, and herbicide resistance. Biotechnology improved the, the ability of breeders to make improvements in, in, in both livestock and crops. And agricultural biotechnology has the potential to advance crop productivity as well as improve food security at the national and the global level. There is unfortunately a growing alarm about the genetically engineered crops and its environmental effects on the food chain. There is a lot of talk about the, the safety of genetically modified organisms and that, and that plays on, on Africans and African policy making. But biotechnology has promise if it is lashed upon the green revolution technologies, it can spur another revolution 
in Africa's agricultural sector. And in our hands, as we saw at the introduction, is the digital revolution or the fourth industrial revolution or the third industrial revolution, which is the, the era of digital electronic equipment that started in the 80s. Implicitly, when we talk of digital, digital industrial revolution, we are talking about, we are referring to sweeping changes brought about by digital computing and communication technologies during this period. The surge in digital technologies available over the past few decades has transformed virtually every sector in the, of the global economy and agriculture is no exception. Agriculture too has benefited from ICTs, from SMS and other opportunities. Since these technologies can be used to, to study the weather or track, collect information on weather, access market information, interact with traders, government agencies, and, and even marketing so that traders and producers, farmers can get paid for their crops. Through its impact on agriculture, the digital revolution is therefore nicknamed as the fourth industrial revolution, as posited by Klaus Schwab, the chairman of the World Economic Forum. Potential benefits to agriculture for the use of digital technologies include improved crop yields, animal performance as well, optimization of process inputs, digitization of, can also improve working conditions for farmers and reduce stress as well as environmental impacts of agriculture. Digital agriculture can help smallholder farmers surmount challenges, increase their productivity and integration into food value chains and supporting the adoption of climate smart um, practices. Another gain relates to agricultural data flows, improving information flows up and downstream in the agri-food chains could result in a series of benefits for those involved, including farmers and other stakeholders. Consumers too, as well as researchers, governments and NGOs can benefit from increased transparency of access to data brought about by the uh, fourth industrial revolution or, the, or, or digitalization. And the digitalization of agricultural activities is also resource saving and attractive, particularly to youths. The challenge is therefore for African policymakers to promote accessibility to digital technology by providing the necessary infrastructure. And when the necessary infrastructure is provided and digital technology is lashed upon and taken seriously, in addition to biotech technology, green revolution technologies, better working output markets, better performing and efficient labor markets, value addition comes in finally as an important avenue for African producers and policymakers and the continent in general to benefit from the agricultural sector. Africa's trade portfolio is typically dominated by primary commodity exports, especially agricultural commodities. In other words, exports are predominantly raw and semi-finished agricultural commodities and minerals. These are low value goods as far as export earnings are concerned. And this has implications for a country's trade balance as well as negative impact on the socioeconomy of countries in the continent. For example, jobs are typically exported when you are exporting raw materials. It means jobs are being exported and potential revenue is lost to nations that have embraced innovation and value addition as a priority in manufacturing models. Value add add added means that you are adding value to raw product by taking it to at least the next stage of production. And Africa will have to add value to its commodities before reaching the retail markets. Value added agriculture, agriculture generates several billions of dollars in economic impact for countries each year. And in fact, the economic impact of adding value beyond the farm gate price is usually several times the value of agricultural production at the farm gate alone. In the figure below, we demonstrate the operating environment for the agricultural value chains. Adding value to commodities as they move along the chain will require support services from the financial institutions and other business development organizations, whether public or private. A, a conducive business environment will facilitate the operations and interaction of the marketing agents to speedily move goods and from, from production to consumption. So there are diverse agents and stakeholders along the value chain. Market forces have led to greater opportunities for product differentiation and value addition because of increased consumer demands, effort, efforts by food processors, technological advances. And women and youth, when they come on board, either as entrepreneurs or consumers or members of 
cooperative organizations could be the primary beneficiaries of the opportunities of product differentiation and value addition, especially the women folk who dominate the farm level production activities. Technological advances will support their efforts and facilitate their contribution along the agricultural food value chain to derive a series of benefits along the, the value chain, which includes promotion of vertical and horizontal integration of agri-based enterprises, increased capacity of utilization by firms, employment creation, job creation, increased disposable income, increased demand for goods and services, increased revenue for government through tax collection, increased in export earnings, as well as shock absorption from international price volatility and price of products. Typically, agricultural producers receive a much smaller portion of their consumers' dollar than do food processors, especially those who produce brand, brand items for the leading supermarket chains. Again, mechanization at all levels of the agricultural chain can finally promote and enhance value addition. And when all of this is achieved in the agricultural sector, these commodities, these bumper harvests and bumper production have to be given away. There must be an exit and the exit is market. Therefore, African countries should be able to access both domestic market and international market. This is where the international trade issue comes in because markets are important for revenue, re revenue generation. Opportunities for international agricultural trade improves the production and supply response of the, of the agricultural sector. And regional integration and regional agricultural markets are particularly important for African agriculture since national markets and institutions are, are too small to bring about all the needed transformation of African agriculture. Policies and markets need to be developed, therefore, at the regional and continental levels for Africa to be able to respond to the growth opportunities related to international markets and to its own food demand, what are projected to increase exponentially, which is projected to increase exponentially in, in the next years because of the demographic changes associated with increased urbanization and the population bulge. We, we've talked about the youth bulge. Regional integration and agricultural development, and in particular, intra-African agricultural trade, therefore offers a great potential for food security and pro poor growth in Africa, if they can work in synergy, especially at the regional level. So countries at regional level have to cooperate. In, in Africa, you have diverse regional arrangements. In, in North Africa, you have the regional trade block. In South Africa, you have SADC. In West Africa, you have ECOWAS. In East Africa, you have the EAC. And in Central Africa, you have the SEMAC, the SEMAC trade block, and many others. And trade, therefore, in these regional organizations help to enable the, the productive sector, and in the case of agriculture, trade enables farmers to capitalize on the economic potential of their produce, helping to turn agriculture into one of the most important contributors to income generation and poor growth. Trade, if properly coordinated, will be a valve through which the efforts of producers, especially women and youth who aspire to invest in the agricultural sector, could be enhanced. However, many challenges still remain for both the coherence and coordination of trade and agricultural policies and programs. African countries find it difficult to access the rich markets in Europe and North America. Therefore, there is need for African countries to trade among themselves. And when more African countries have intra-African trade and regional integration in general, it will help the agricultural sector to live up to its proper agenda and, 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 and food security potentials. But the right synergies have to be found between different components of regional cooperation and integration, as well as between different public and private stakeholders. This will require policy reforms. Policy, and African countries have engaged in policy reforms since the 1990s, the structural adjustment programs that involve the removal of barriers in private sector involvement, deregulations and elimination of taxes and subsidies, privatization of state corporations and state marketing boards, Especially those are hard to deal with, 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 uh, with agricultural commodities, as well as abolition of official mo monopolies Okay, and, and Africa at the, at, the, at the continental level, the African Union itself has acknowledged the importance of regional markets and regional trade. And it has floated and rolled out the African continental free trade area, which has the potential to promote agricultural growth and lift millions of people out of poverty in the continent. But its effectiveness depends on approval and implementation. Okay, uh, according to UNTAC, the United Nations Agency on Trade, between, trade between African countries is still very, very small. It's very, very minimal. And the African continental free trade area should be able to reverse that trend of low intra-African trade. Intra-African trade could prove to be a key avenue to achieving sustainable development for countries in the region. And increased regional integration in trade and investment could lead to an expansion of, agriculture, of, the, of the expansion in the agricultural sectors of exporting countries and an overall improvement in the region's um, 
region's com competitiveness. So, so it the Africa the African agricultural sector has a potential to guide the continent to make the leap from its current doldrums to where to the transition that African countries find themselves for improved welfare, increased uh, well-being, um, higher incomes be gen being generated and, and revenue ripped, which can be plowed back into the provision of uh, growth supporting infrastructure of roads, electricity, water, you know, and so on. So the potentials are, are huge and Africa needs to tailor its policy agenda to cater for diverse issues within the agricultural sector. And there are lessons to learn from the agricultural revolutions that have taken place over the centuries from the um, first agricultural revolution into the uh, green revolution. And now we have the digital, digital revolution. African countries should not be left behind. And, and there are significant opportunities along the, the agricultural value chain for women and youth to latch on on the many opportunities which they can exploit to provide services as entrepreneurs and or agripreneurs and begin to make wealth and create, create opportunities for themselves and their families. Thank you.